A reading from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of spiteful people, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, in you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit to your cause, to the Lord, let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he does not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise to the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he 
has done it. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by COVID-19. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us and surround those who are sick and hospitalized. Give strength to those who care for them and success to those working to eradicate this deadly virus. Hear our Lord, hear our prayer, O Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and share in the goodness of your creation. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to workers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are not abandoned. The good news of Good Friday is you are not abandoned. For all the times and all the ways we feel and even believe in our very hearts that we are forgotten, this day especially most clearly declares you are not abandoned. The great poet Pablo Neruda recalled his 1948 escape to Argentina from Chile. He was, he was running for his life. The dictator had called for his arrest and he was going to be sentenced to death if he was caught, so he fled. He had to go through the mountains of Chile to get to Argentina. When he won a Nobel Prize for his poetry in the 1970s, he recalled that trip. Neruda said, down there on those vast expanses in my native country, where I was taken by events which had already fallen into oblivion, one has to cross, and I was compelled to cross the Andes to find the frontier of my country with Argentina. Great forests make these inaccessible areas like a tunnel through which our journey was secret and forbidden, with only the faintest signs to show us the way. There were no tracks and no paths, and I and my four companions riding on horseback pressed forward on our treacherous way, avoiding the obstacles set by huge trees, impassable rivers, immense cliffs, and desolate expanses of snow, blindly seeking the quarter in which my liberty lay. Those who were with me knew how to make their way forward between the dense leaves of the forest, but to feel safer they marked their route by slashing with their machetes here and there in the bark of the great trees leaving tracks which they would follow back when they had left me alone with my destiny. Each one of us made his way forward, filled with this limitless solitude, with the green and white silence of trees and huge trailing plants and layers of soil laid down over centuries, 
among half-fallen tree trunks, which suddenly appeared as fresh obstacles to bar our progress. We were in a dazzling and secret world of nature, which at the same time was a growing menace of cold, snow, and persecution. Everything became one, the solitude, the danger, the silence, and the urgency of my mission. Many considered Neruda the greatest poet of the 20th century in any language. And he often cited this experience, this horrible journey, as what gave him insight and why his words related to so many people around the world. This night we remember all of our darkness, pain, loss, sin, death, and times that we were convinced we were abandoned. Especially this year, as we're experiencing being separated, and many of us are feeling alone and forgotten, Good Friday names that place and space fully. The denial, the flogging, the cries for crucifixion, the spikes driven into flesh and bone, and the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remind us that Jesus entered into every single aspect of the human condition. We do not celebrate divine violence this night. What we do is name darkness, and we claim that sense of abandonment we all have felt. We know our thoughts have been there, and oftentimes our words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, God? Why are you so far away from helping? We also remember all the senseless deaths around the world. We remember all those who have feel and have felt forsaken. We remember all those who stand up in the name of justice and many who died speaking those words of liberation. We name sin and death for all the devastating horror they bring to our lives. And then we look at the cross. As Jesus is dying, we notice, we realize, we're reminded once again that even when God seemed silent, he trusted in the promise, I will not abandon you. Leading up to his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus taught every day through his words and his deeds. What he taught was you are not abandoned. He said that the poor, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, and those who are hated and reviled and persecuted were blessed. They were honored by God. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He touched the leper. He spoke to women. He modeled forgiveness and grace. He embodied the promise you are not abandoned in all of his conversations and all of his actions. This night, as we look at the cross, we remember the suffering and we remember the promise you were not abandoned became incarnational through the one who was hanging on the cross. Amen. I'd like to close with a prayer by Walter Brueggemann. Suffering God, we dare pray while the darkness descends and the earthquake trembles. We dare pray for eyes to see fully and mouths to speak fully the power of death all around. We pray more for your notice and your promise and your healing. Our only urging on Friday is that you live this as we must, impacted but not destroyed, dimmed but not quenched. For your great staying power and your promise of newness, we praise you. It is in your power and your promise that we take our stand this day. We dare trust that Friday is never the last day. So we watch for the new day of life. Hear our prayer and be your full self toward us. Amen. A reading from John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink of the cup that my father has given to me? So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrived, arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went to Jesus with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing by, nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. And they asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him, your, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We're not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? 
Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judgment bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and him with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. 
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it and see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was empty, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. Dearest Jesus, even in death you are there. When we mourn, when we are afraid, when we come to our own end, you have been there too. Come alongside us in the darkness and carry us through death to life. 